The next item of business is debate on motion 18778 in the name of Michael Russell on the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please. And I call on Michael Russell to speak to you and move the motion for 11 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am sure that every member of this Parliament will always listen attentively to what Scotland has to say. All of us as MSPs listen to and act on what we hear in our constituencies and regions, in surgeries and in local events. We meet and learn from individuals who bring us their worries, their concerns, their ideas and even their enthusiasms. All of us as legislators, as members and some of us as ministers also hear and pay heed to national and international voices from the third sector, from unions, from business, from those who lobby in one way or another for or against change and reform, for representative groups from wider civil society, from faith groups, from our universities and from many more. And we also hear the voice of Scotland every time a member contributes to committee or plenary in this chamber, carrying his or her concerns informed by listening and thinking. This is Scotland's Parliament, where the representatives of the people of Scotland, elected by a fair system of proportional representation, speak on behalf of their parties and, more importantly, their electors. The last few years of Brexit division show that listening is important, but they also show that we must do better. If we're to row back from the current impasse and find a way forward as a nation, we must listen to new voices and in new ways. We must turn down the volume on what divides us and turn it up on ways of moving forward together. And to do so, we must not just listen, we must pay attention, focus and understand, and then we must act. And that is what the Citizens' Sem Assembly of Scotland is about. It is a radical act of listening, an intervention in a political culture that can seem more concerned with making its own point no matter the cost, than listening to the points of view of others. Now, nobody, presiding officer, could deny that I am a robust politician. I was schooled in a robust age of debate, and sometimes it shows. I'm as guilty as anyone in this chamber of misusing language. But the times we are in call for other voices to be heard and people to speak in other ways. Formal politics is not the only way to find solutions. Sometimes it may not even be the best way. The Assembly is therefore about doing things a different way, with a different tone and developing a different democratic language. International experience shows that such approaches can bring new perspectives and new solutions. But by definition, such initiatives are not about politicians. And therefore, this debate today marks the moment at which Scotland's Citizens' Assembly becomes an independent entity, reaching out to make a new contribution to our country. The Citizens' Assembly of Scotland now has its remit, and Parliament is being invited to endorse it. It is our first National Citizens' Assembly sponsored by government, but wholly separate from it, and its remit goes to the heart of the question facing our country. The remit asks the Assembly to consider three things. What type of country we are seeking to build, how best we can overcome the challenges Scotland and the world face in the 21st century, including those arising from Brexit, and what further work should be carried out to give us the information we need to make informed choices about our future. These are broad questions, but deliberately so. The Assembly will listen, deliberate and come to conclusions. It's entirely free to define what it thinks are the challenges facing Scotland and the world. Within the framework set out in the remit in terms of reference, it will set its own agenda, put in place its own work plan and draw its own conclusions. Could that agenda take it to places that are uncomfortable for this government? Of course. And if I'm prepared to accept and acknowledge that, then I have to say constructively to those who still stand against this initiative, what are you worried about? If I'm open to the views of the Assembly in one moment, if I am open to the views in one moment, if I am open to the views of the Assembly, surely you should be too. Surely you not, are not afraid to listen. Mike Rumbles. Glad the Minister took the intervention and is not afraid to listen. One of the problems is, is that there is a great lack of trust about the government's motivation for this. If Mike Russell. Russell. Presiding officer, the lack of trust, oh, I'm seeking part. to address this today. I will say more about the independence of the Citizens' Assembly now. And I'm sure that uh, all members, including Mr. Simpson, who finds this entertaining, might trust me a little to find out how this is going to move forward. We should all, presiding officer, want to be challenged by the Assembly, as it will say things and do things that make each and every one of us think anew and reflect anew. Think anew and reflect anew. <laughs> of course. Adam Tompkins. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. On this subject of, of, of trust and thinking anew, does the Cabinet Secretary agree 
with the remarks attributed to David Martin, one of the co-conveners of the Assembly, that it was, in his words, a mistake to introduce into Scotland the idea of a citizens' assembly as part of a package of measures seeking independence for the country. Michael Russell. I've heard David Martin's view on this. Um, I think in retrospect, I can understand why people think that. There was no intention, I have to say, presiding officer, to do, well, 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 uh, presiding officer, I'm, I'm trying to make a point which can be believed or not believed. There was no intention to say that the Citizens' Assembly would be driving forward the any other agenda than the one I've put forward. I understand David Martin's point of view. I respect that point of view. And if time had been different, if we have our time again, perhaps we would have done it in a different way. I, I think that's a fair reflection of where I stand. So the first and important step, however, achieving a fully independent Citizens' Assembly was the appointment of two entirely independent conveners, whose role is to steward lead and represent the Assembly. David Martin and his distinguished track record as a Labour MEP speaking for Scotland in Europe will be familiar to everyone here and his integrity and expertise when it comes to many of the most pressing issues of the day is unimpeachable. Kate Wimpress has established and led arts organisations in Scotland and Northern Ireland for nearly 30 years. She brings to her new role considerable experience and insight into the engaging and inspiring of communities into how best to listen, how to amplify the voices of the less heard. The presiding officer, it is over to them now. We've also published this week a memorandum of understanding between the Scottish Government and the conveners. This memorandum, I hope, will make real the promises we have made about the Assembly's independence. It provides for a secretariat accountable to and taking their direction from the conveners for a budget and for the Assembly to be able to receive directly and independently the advice, support and services it requires. It's essential that this Assembly is run to the highest standards of public administration, that it demonstrates the potential for deliberative democracy and fulfills the ambition of everyone involved to develop something inclusive, accessible and open-minded. I understand the need for reassurance. I'm happy to meet with any representative of any party that wants to discuss it further. I'd encourage them to meet the conveners and to discuss these matters. And recruitment for the members has already begun. People are out there knocking on doors, working to find a broadly representative cross-section of Scottish society to take part in something very special which for six weekends between October and April next year, they will debate, share views, and decide on recommendations that could shape the future of their country. Now, the first meeting will be held over the weekend of 26th and 27th of October. That's only days before the current date of prospective EU exit. Things will undoubtedly change before then and change again before the Assembly finally reports in May next year. There will, it is almost certain, be a general election in the UK. This government will continue to press for a referendum which would allow the United Kingdom to stay in the EU. We will request the Section 30 order that will put this Parliament's ability to hold a referendum on the constitutional future of our country, which it has voted for, beyond challenge. Presiding officer, that uncertain background doesn't imperil the Citizens' Assembly. It makes it even more essential. With public attention focused on the latest indignity to emerge from Westminster, the Assembly will take a calmer, longer-term perspective. During a period when claims of competing camps are likely to increase, I, I really have to make progress, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think I would be given too much extra time by the, can, uh, by the presiding officer. During a period where the claims of competing camps are likely to increase in their vehemence, the evidence-based and balanced approach of the Assembly will help provide us with facts, considered opinions, and a framework for thinking. Whenever we end up in spring next year, wherever we are debating, none of us will, I hope, wish to turn away from an informed, representative, and balanced contribution to our national debate. I began by saying, presiding officer, I wanted to know and to listen to what Scotland thinks. But I'll go further. I, we need to know what Scotland thinks. We need to know the type of country the people of Scotland want to build. We need to know what people think are the greatest challenges. And we need to know what information the people of Scotland want to have if they are, we are to face up the responsibility of overcoming these challenges. The Brexit debate has demonstrated what discord can arise when big constitutional questions are posed in a way that does not include a whole country, in a way that distorts rather than informs, in a way that allows no one, whatever side of the debate they're on, to have confidence in the terms or the implications of the outcome. It has shown what happens when there is only heat in a debate, with no light to shine into our different thoughts, fears and hopes. All parties in this chamber have spoken of the need to improve dialogue, to step back, to consider all points of view more carefully, 
this assembly provides us with the opportunity to relearn how. This assembly will report as it sees fit to this parliament, to the government, and to the people of Scotland. Its remit in terms of pre re reference require its report to be laid before parliament. It expects this parliament to consider and scrutinize the report, and it requires the Scottish government to set out within three months what it intends to do in respect to the assembly's recommendations. The Assembly's report will not replace this Parliament's democratic function of deliberating and deciding. It's one part of Scotland's story, but I hope it will be a big and significant part. Presiding officer, this Parliament was the beginning of a new sign. To follow on Seafield's famous remark about 1707 being the end of an old sign. But a song can have many voices, and the more they sing in harmony, the better they sound. This will be Scotland's first National Citizens' Assembly, but not its last. The Green Party are proposing a future assembly on climate change. This government will be happy to endorse that, help to make it happen in this session of Parliament. I believe adding citizens' assemblies to our civic and democratic structures is a natural step for this open and more inclusive Parliament. I'm sure that the lessons of the first one will help that happen. When Henry MacLeish presented the report of the Cross-Party Steering Group in 1998, he set out the key principles that should guide the design of this place. They included an ambition that the Parliament should embody and reflect the sharing of power between the peoples of Scotland. We've done a lot to live up to that ideal, but we can do more. 20 years ago, this Parliament met for the first time. 20 years on, let's resolve to continue to in innovate in the service of those who put us here and to ensure that they are more and more at the heart of what we do. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. I now call on Winnie, Willie Rennie to speak to and move the amendment 18778.1 for seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I seem to have upset, upset Mike Russell. Um, he is so upset that he frequently takes to social media to plead that I talk to him. I know it's difficult to believe that I could upset such a self-effacing, modest, self-deprecating gentleman who's a member of this chamber. But if I can say to Mike Russell this afternoon that we'd be happy to talk any time on most issues. Indeed, we talk a lot on many issues over many, many months. In fact, we worked together on the EU withdrawal bill and the continuity bill. We didn't just work together, we agreed with each other on that. We agreed that the Conservative government were taking powers that should right, uh, rightly have been placed here from the very beginning. We, we talked about the people's vote. In fact, we eventually persuaded them to back the people's vote. So we will work together where we can agree. We also support the Citizens' Assembly as a, a method, as a means to reach agreement on the way ahead on challenging issues. For example, to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions, people will need to be prepared to make more radical changes in their day-to-day -day lives. Such, as, such changes, through, though, must have the democratic foundation and a citizens' assembly on the climate would help to provide exactly that. We need to understand the different perspectives people have and the different ways in which this process will affect their lives. So that transition to a carbon neutral economy can be accomplished as quickly and as fairly and as legitimately as possible. And it can be done through those assemblies. That's the kind of measure that we think the assembly would be ideally suited for. That's why we deeply, deeply regret that the first opportunity to utilize this tool was when the first minister announced it earlier this year as part of a statement all about the next steps to achieve independence. That's what Mike Russell's upset about, that he complains that we won't take part, but we don't support independence. How could we take part in that kind of initiative? So can he really blame us when we listen to David Martin? As Adam Tompkins has already highlighted, he said it was a mistake to wrap the two together. And he was right. It is deeply flawed as a result. The process is flawed. Now, I'm a, an avid reader of the national newspaper. Um, that, that journal, that record of all things Scottish. Moving on from their campaign earlier this summer about the harassment of Scottish strawberry producers who dared to put the union flag on their strawberry punnets, they turned their attention to the Citizens' Assembly. I thought it was good to give space over to this issue. In fact, they gave space to Joanna Cherry. Remember, Joanna Cherry, she's very famous today outside the court, 
who speaks for the party on home affairs in the House of Commons. She wrote this. I have been inundated with queries about how a citizens' assembly <coughs> might work and how it could help us achieve independence. And she went on. I was delighted when the First Minister embraced my plan as part of the package of measures paving the way for independence referendum too. The Citizens' Assembly process will lay the foundation for the referendum. And Joanna Cherry went further at the SNP conference. With some degree of excitement, she told delegates that the Citizens' Assembly would be a concrete way to achieve our goal, which is to create a consensus around Scotland and a bigger majority for yes. A bigger majority for yes. Adam Tompkins. Adam Tompkins. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Rennie for taking the intervention. I wonder if Mr Rennie knows that earlier on this afternoon in this chamber, in portfolio questions, the Cabinet Secretary, Mike Russell, was invited from these benches to distance himself from the remarks of Joanna Cherry, and that was an invitation he declined to take up. Oh. Oh. Willie Rennie. I find that astonishing, difficult to believe. Point of order, Michael Russell. I think it would be important that the actual words I used were quoted in this, and I think the official report might too want to produce them. On no occasion were they used, I refused to distance myself. I made my position very clear as the minister responsible for this. I think that should have been quoted properly and not improperly. Both points have been made, and uh, the official report can be checked later on today. And appropriate steps taken by any member who so wishes to do. Willie Rennie. Uh, Joanna Cherry seems to have created a certain degree of excitement, not just, <laughs> not just in the courts today, but in this chamber. And I think that's quite right, because I am incredibly grateful to Joanna Cherry, because she's given us such clarity, in fact, such honesty. But her expose of the real purpose of the Assembly makes it impossible for us to take part in it. We now know it is a ruse. It's a scheme, it's a mechanism to help their campaign for independence. Now, I favour abolishing... <laughs> the member says that it's our obsession about independence. <laughs> this was their idea to have the Citizens' Assembly. It was their idea to wrap it up with independence. It was their Member of Parliament that put independence at the heart of it. So don't say that we're obsessed about independence. It's them that are obsessed about independence. Look, I favour abolishing the House of Lords, changing the unfair first-past-the-post voting system. Having a written constitution, wouldn't that have helped us today if we had that written constitution? Powerful regional and national assemblies and parliament, a federal structure. But all of that is impossible to have a discussion in the assemblies with this half Machiavellian. It's not even Machiavellian. It's half Machiavellian. It's half clever. It's an SNP <laughs> approach. It's a Joanna Cherry-inspired citizens' assembly. And that's why we can have absolutely nothing to do with it. And no one who wants to keep the United Kingdom together should have anything to do with it either. Once we have stopped Brexit, we need to change the UK. But the idea that this very moment in the national crisis, we need yet another discussion about independence. Another discussion. For goodness sake, let's move on. Let's stop Brexit. Let's get this country on track. Let's reform this country. This Citizens' Assembly has got absolutely nothing to do with that. Uh, Mr Rennie, could you move your amendment? <laughs> in, in all the excitement, I forgot to move the amendment. I moved the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Adam Tompkins for six minutes, please. Well, thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Um, I want to turn my attention first to the Liberal Democrat uh, um, Amendment, which has just been so movingly moved um, uh, by, by Mr Rennie. And we on these benches very strongly agree with every word of it, not quite with every word of his speech, um, but with, uh, certainly with the sentiment uh, behind it. The, it. It is a matter of deep regret, I think, um, that the idea of a Citizens' Assembly for Scotland was introduced uh, into this Parliament and into uh, Scottish politics as part of a package of measures designed by the First Minister uh, to achieve independence uh, for Scotland. And I think everybody can understand 
Even Mike Russell can understand why that has made us all so deeply suspicious uh, of this, just as we have our suspicions uh, about the referendums bill, uh, which is another part uh, of the same package. And for all of these reasons, Deputy Presiding Officer, we will be voting for the Liberal Democrat amendment tonight. Uh, now I want to turn uh, my attention to the government motion uh, itself. And the first thing that the government motion uh, says um, uh, is uh, that the Parliament supports the use of deliberative democracy in Scotland. Well, I, I do support it. I do support the use of deliberative democracy in Scotland. And let me um, uh, explain why, or try and explain why, briefly, presiding officer, if I can. My reason for being supportive of the idea of de de deliberative democracy in Scotland is because I don't think party politics gets everything right. Uh, I don't think that this parliament um, has shown that it is able to get to the bottom of every social or economic problem uh, that faces uh, Scotland uh, today. For all of its merits, for all of its virtues, this parliament does not have all of the answers, even when we all come together to agree uh, that a, a, an issue is of pressing national importance. Climate change might be one good example. And if we had started with the Citizens' Assembly on climate change and then moved to other matters, I think that would have been infinitely preferable to starting with the Constitution and with the SNP's obsession on independence. But another example, and an example I've given before, you know, we all agree that Scotland faces a crisis when it comes to drugs deaths. You know, there is cross-party agreement that this is an issue which blights our nation and which I think shames us all, actually, that we have not been able to come together as a parliament to agree uh, a way forward. It is an issue which, unfortunately, and I think this is actually, it's not just unfortunate, it's appalling, that it has become constitutionalized about where reserved powers lie with regard to safe consumption facilities. It's exactly the kind of issue that party politics is failing to address in Scotland and that a citizens' assembly could and should, in my view, be established uh, to address. And if we'd started there, if we'd started with climate change, if we'd started with drugs deaths, then perhaps we could have had much less suspicion around the idea of citizens' assemblies, and perhaps we could have had genuine all-party support for it. Happy to give way. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I very much accept much of what the member has said about drug deaths, and I first was involved in uh, difficulties in this area in the early 1960s. Would it be helpful, though, if across the UK, all of those who might be able to influence policy and practice on drug deaths were able to sit in the f one room together? Or does it need a citizens' assembly to summon such people and bypass the political system? I'm not quite clear what the member is saying. Adam Tompkins. Um, well, the answer to the first part of the question is yes, it would be helpful and it should happen, um, in, in my view. And I know what the consequences of that are. Um, the next part of the government's uh, motion, uh, presiding officer, uh, notes uh, various matters, which, again, we're very happy to note. We note the appointment of the conveners, we note the principles and remit of the Citizens' Assembly, we note its terms of reference, and we uh, note, likewise, that the Citizens' Assembly's report will be laid before Parliament. We have no objection to any of those elements of the motion. And then the final part of the motion says that the government will consider the recommendations that come forward from the Citizens' Assembly and that Parliament uh, will decide on those recommendations. Again, fine, I think that broadly gets the balance right between the role of the Citizens' Assembly, the role of the government to consider recommendations and the role of Parliament to decide. Um, but we will listen uh, to what the SNP have to say, not just from the front bench, but from back benches as well this afternoon about this motion before deciding how to vote on it tonight. If this becomes, as we suspect it will, and as we suspect it is, a proxy for independence, or for full fiscal autonomy, or for Devo Max, or for any other constitutional scheme designed to undermine the integrity of the United Kingdom, then we will vote against the government motion uh, tonight. There is one very significant emission, um, omission from the government motion, and that is the question of cost. What is it costing to establish the Citizens' Assembly, to administer it, to run it? What are we paying members? What are we paying conveners? What are we paying the civil servants who will help to, uh, to, to service it? Um, in the press, it's been reported that the cost of a Citizens' Assembly will be some half a million pounds. I don't know if the minister can shed uh, any light on that. I'm happy to give away to him if he will. Michael Wait. Russell. Um, I, I think a key issue in the Citizens' Assembly is, is transparency. And the Assembly will be committed to publishing its costs in full. Right? So at the appropriate moment, and that will be up to the Assembly when it does that, it will do so. And I don't think there'll be any doubt about that, and it will be for everybody to see. Adam Tompkins. 
Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the minister for, 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 for that, although he didn't actually shine any light on the question. He just said it will be transparent at some point in the future. Look, we've heard, um, it's been quoted before already this afternoon, what David Martin has said about the coupling of Citizens' Assembly uh, in Scotland with the idea of, indep of independence. But it's not just David Martin who is of this view. Neil Mackay, I think the former editor of the Sunday Herald and an independent supporting journalist, has said this, and I quote, the idea was a simple, elegant addition to our democracy. But the SNP has now stomped all over it, he said, politicised it and made it look falsely like a propaganda unit. The party's behaviour is completely counterproductive. And I quote that, presiding officer, not in anger but in sadness. I think this, is, this had the potential to be a really good idea. It had the potential to be a really useful addition to the parliamentary democracy that we have here in Scotland, and the SNP have ruined it. The SNP have ruined it because they have coupled it with independence, and that has made us all very suspicious of what their true motivations are here. Alex Rowley, six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. In opening for Labour today, I would like to state our support for the principles of citizens' assemblies. I would also like to welcome the appointment of both David Martin and Kate Wimpress to the Citizens' Assembly for Scotland. I do have faith that they will be both independent and hard-working co-conveners. Too often these days I find myself having to advocate for democracy and reiterating the point that while flawed, it is still a good thing. More democracy is certainly no bad thing and the principles of a deliberative democracy and its use in Scotland should be welcomed. Citizens' assemblies are a proven and respected method when done properly. They can help get services working together and allow us as a country to further develop a culture of citizenship. One of the key benefits is that they can allow complex issues to be explored in depth by the people who are directly affected all of this is surely a good thing. In addressing the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie, I understand the point and concerns he raises, and I recognise that the purpose of the Assembly has been muddied by at least one SNP MP who asserted this Assembly was to move us towards independence. So I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary, in his summing up, will clarify this point again. I know he's done so already, but if he can clarify that again. The way I understand it, the government are committed to bringing the Assembly forward in good faith. And if this is indeed the case, we will participate in good faith in return. I have some experience. Yep. Mike Rumbles. It is about motivations. I mean, the First Minister said we face a climate emergency and we made the point that this would have been an ideal vehicle for attacking that climate emergency. This is not an emergency, however you look at it. Alex Rowley. I'll certainly come on to that point. I have some experience in deliberative democracy. While I was leader of Fife Council, we held one of the first citizens' juries in the country. This was back in March 1997, and it was established to examine what public agencies and local communities could do to create employment opportunities in Leavenmouth. This was an incredibly positive experience, and at the end, the jury made over 50 recommendations, most of which I'm pleased to say were implemented. When speaking with the people that have taken part in these kind of juries or assemblies, one of the key messages that comes across is how positive the experience was. Here are some of the views that were given by participants in the recent Irish Citizens Assembly. And I quote, it helped me to listen, understand and develop empathy. It got balanced and truthful information out among the people of Ireland. It took the debate out of the realm of fearful self-interested calculation. All of this we could surely use in our politics in Scotland at the moment. I am told that one of the key messages to learn coming out of the Irish Assembly was how to engage with the press and get them on board at an early stage. It can be too easy for the press to see citizens' assemblies in a negative or sceptical light. 
So I believe it is key to the success of the Scottish Assembly for the press to be fully engaged in the process at all stages. That also brings about much greater transparency. I am pleased that it has been stated that the Citizens' Assembly for Scotland will be independent, transparent and inclusive. These objectives are good and I am sure will get widespread support throughout the country. We are willing to go into this with an open mind and I hope that the Government are willing to do the same. The questions proposed to frame the Citizens' Assembly of what kind of country are we seeking to build? How can we overcome the challenges Scotland faces, including Brexit? And how can people be given the detail they need to make informed choices about Scotland's future are surely welcome questions. And Scottish Labour is willing to engage in these discussions. Our country is undergoing a massive political upheaval. And we need to work together where we can to ensure a level of stability is returned to the whole of the United Kingdom. The questions framing the Assembly are questions I myself would like to answer. And I believe through collaborative working and engaged discussions with the public, we can set out the kind of Scotland we want to see flourish into the future. We are not a party that stands for the status quo. So we will engage in these discussions on what kind of country we want to live in and what best meets the needs and aspirations of the Scottish people. And I am clear, part of this will be constitutional, social and economic reform across the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is far too centralised as a state. Indeed, Scotland has become that way as well. And we would like to see reform of how our state operates at an economic, political and constitutional level. And we would hope the discussion takes us in that direction. I will finish, presiding officer, by saying to the Tories and the Liberals, we cannot stand still. We cannot go backwards. Support this initiative and let Scotland move forward. I now call Patrick Harvey. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I welcome the, the motion that's been brought for debate today. I, I think the Greens have long-standing expressed support for deliberative democracy in a range of different forms. At, at a local level, uh, with uh, participatory budgeting, for example, we've seen that it can be done well or done badly. And we need to, as we explore the, the greater use of deliberative democracy, we need to learn uh, from that experience. I don't think that learning uh, is, is going to be well served uh, by the, the kind of debate that so far we've seen this afternoon. Deliberative democracy, and, and Adam Tompkins is, is right about this, does not in any way need to be seen as in conflict with parliamentary democracy or undermining the role of elected governments or elected parliaments. It can be and should be complementary and enriching, enriching in a way that there was so chronically missing in the run-up to 2016. Adam Tompkins and I are both on the, the Finance and Constitution Committee, which has been hearing evidence on the referendums bill. And while we, I'm sure, won't agree on everything about that, one of the common themes that I think we can all recognize from the evidence that we've heard so far is a distinction between a referendum held in the full light of a well-worked up, detailed proposition either published legislation or something detailed like the, the Scottish Government's white paper, and on the other hand, what we saw in, in 2016, a referendum based on a, a narrow proposition, something as simplistic as a slogan, take back control. I think the Irish experience of using citizens' assemblies to inform, to inform and enrich the debate about constitutional change uh, in their country is something that we should learn from, something that is a far greater uh, uh, expression of, uh, of genuinely deep democracy uh, than what we saw in, in 2016. And if the question on EU membership, for example, had been subject to that kind of detailed deliberation in advance, I think we would have ended up with a much richer debate and far greater clarity about what should happen uh, as a result. Inevitably, further constitutional change is coming. 
whether Brexit goes forward and is implemented, and I hope that it can still be stopped, or if it is killed off in its tracks, and we simply reflect on what has happened to us over these last three years, and the level of contempt that has been shown uh, to Scotland's democracy by the UK government. Further constitutional change is clearly coming. Let's make sure that when it comes, it is as informed as it could be, as it could possibly be, uh, by that deliberative process. Now, I understand that you know, some people want to see this simply as, a, as an opportunity to have a, a proxy debate about independence. Adam Tompkins doesn't need to be suspicious that the SNP might privately, secretly, covertly support independence. We all know that they do. He knows that I support independence. I know that he doesn't. I have no fear from a citizens' assembly that wants to consider whatever proposals Adam Tompkins comes forward with, even if it was to support in every dot and comma the UK government's proposals for what should happen after Brexit. I would have no hesitation in seeing a Citizens' Assembly consider those options and I wouldn't feel threatened by it. I give way. Adam Tompkins. I, I'm very grateful to Mr Harvey for giving way. I, I don't feel threatened, Mr Harvey, but the difference is this. In Ireland, Citizens' Assembly had all-party buy-in because Citizens' Assembly started on issues where the all parties agreed needed to be addressed by a Citizens' Assembly and that is not the case in Scotland and that's what I regret. Well, Patrick Harvey. Indeed, I regret that, that Mr. Tompkins' party isn't buying in. He's perfectly capable of buying in and, and, and seeing any issues that he thinks the Citizens' Assembly should consider, uh, it will consider. Uh, similarly, uh, I will in just a moment. Similarly, with the Liberal Democrats, I don't think that a Citizens' Assembly should rule, for example, that federalism uh, is, uh, is, is should, to be rejected. But I, I, I don't think that the, the Liberal Democrats should be unwilling to see a Citizens' Assembly come forward and offer their proposals to it. Mike Rumbles. Thank you for giving way. Would he not agree with me that we can all agree and have agreed in this chamber that we face a climate emergency? I would have thought he of all people would have wanted to see the first subject that this Citizens' Assembly address is this climate emergency, yet we've heard nothing about it from him. Patrick Harvey. Well, he, the, Mr. Rumbles does know, I'm sure, that that was the basis of our amendment, and I'll come on to that uh, in a moment. I do want to say, though, uh, that unlike him, I do think that the current constitutional crisis that we are in also constitutes an emergency. From the uh, contempt that's been shown for devolution uh, to the, um, the uh, today what has been deemed an illegal proroguing of Parliament, uh, I, I do think that we're in a constitutional crisis which should be considered an emergency. I regret that the only amendment that we will be able to vote on today, therefore, uh, is the Liberal Democrat one. The Green Amendment did learn from the experience in Ireland, which, for example, uh, identified broad brushstroke ideas like the role of taxation uh, in the transition to a low-carbon economy. Not answering the detailed questions, but addressing that broad brushstroke. I think that the climate change bill gives us the opportunity to use the same deliberative democracy approach uh, in relation to climate change. I'm glad that the minister has said he supports that. I hope that he will say on the record uh, that he will back an amendment to the climate change bill to mandate that process. And although I'm not able to move that amendment today, presiding officer, I do propose it, and I propose it to all parties in this chamber that they will back uh, an amendment to the climate change bill as well to ensure that we can move forward in that open, participative and deliberative process in relation to climate, just as we should and must in relation to the Constitution. Now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of six minutes, please. We're quite tight for time, so any interventions will have to be included within the six minutes. And I call Angela Constance to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. The motion before us today is uh, asking Parliament to endorse the point that deliberation should be at the heart of our decision making. And I feel that uh, now more than ever, we need our politics to be the, the, the product of fair and rational debate. And I'm not for a minute suggesting that we strip out passion uh, from our politics, as we always need to show that we care. But I think that in these troubled times, we very much need to bring back into vogue uh, clear calm heads and good old fashioned uh, common sense. And 
In that regard, I do believe uh, citizens' assemblies uh, have a, a contribution to make in, in helping to change uh, some aspects of our political culture and discourse. I'm a big fan of the author Zadie Smith, and she counsels us that for uh, progress to survive, it needs to be looked after and reimagined. And the events of the past few weeks uh, show that we just can't take our democracy for granted. And while I have never, uh, as a lifelong nationalist, wanted to be ruled from Westminster, I've always felt somewhat disengaged from it. I do nonetheless have every right as a citizen uh, to be absolutely outraged that the so-called mother of parliaments is being prorogued, uh, the longest suspension in recent history, uh, and to hear ministers of Her Majesty's government speculate on the TV about how they may, might find ways around legislation. And I'm sure that I'm not alone uh, in that within this chamber across the political divide. And the reality is we are in a big national uh, crisis across uh, the UK. And the other reality is that at the end of the day, uh, no one knows uh, what will uh, happen next, although we all like to, to speculate. So I do think it is important that here in Scotland, uh, in our parliament, that we meet to discuss how we strengthen our democracy. And while we shouldn't view citizens' assemblies in isolation, uh, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, when you get to my age, you realise that nothing ever is. But it is potentially one part of a broader system of civic participation that could underpin a well-developed and functioning democracy. And whether at home or abroad, we see other factors that may challenge or may change our democracy as we know it. Globalisation, the rise of populism, the increase of corporate power, technological changes, social media as a news outlet and a campaign tool, the climate emergency and poverty and inequality a range of emergencies that won't necessarily be able to be tackled in isolation from each other, but all of which can lead to disengagement uh, and distrust. So to protect our democracy, we need to constantly seek better ways to, to reach out and engage. And this is important because parliaments are really truly representative of the people they seek to serve with the prominence of so many Torians at Westminster, to me, it increasingly uh, looks and sounds like a period drama from the 1950s. But uh, neither are we in this parliament uh, truly representative of the diversity of Scotland. And there are many folk from our different communities that are just simply missing. And this, of course, needs to be addressed, preferably within the 21st century, but it does underline the point that we need other forums out with the parliamentary bubble to inform our work and our decision making. And the question being posed uh, to the Citizens' Assembly uh, is entirely open. Uh, what kind of country are we seeking to build and how do we overcome the challenges we face? And we all need to be committed to really listen, uh, think and then respond. And in that regard, I do think the government has outlined in the motion uh, its respect of this parliament. And I think it is important not to um, miss the potential or the, the spirit of a citizens' assembly uh, in that you can neither prejudice the outcome uh, or pre-write your response to it. If you set up an independent assembly, you can't control it. And I think David Martin uh, has certainly uh, demonstrated his uh, independence. We know that in a democracy, people are entitled to change their minds. They're also entitled to stick to their guns. The reality is that the question of Scotland's constitutional future has not evaporated. We can, of course, uh, debate why that is and what we should or should not do about it. There'll be a range of views, but whatever your position of Scotland's constitutional future, surely we can all agree that whatever happens, we will need to find a path to travel on together on a range of issues. President Officer, if I can end with one of Sadie Smith's uh, clarion calls of calling on us all to stop worrying about uh, your identity and concern yourself with the people that you care about, uh, the ideas that matter to you and the beliefs you can run on. And I think we should all heed these words and in the times that lie ahead, 
while we all have to be wary uh, of making predictions, I think we're all going to have to step outside our boxes and our comfort zones. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, forgive my scepticism, presiding officer, but this Citizens' Assembly is no more than a Trojan horse. At first glance, it's a benign chance to let the public have a say mired with a hidden agenda. But here we have it again. It's another chance for the SNP to push their independence plan. And this time, it's in the form of a Citizens' Assembly. We've heard today it all, is already been doomed to fail to represent the people of Scotland and the SNP have fallen at the first hurdle in terms of their transparency and fairness. I see Mike Russell sitting there with his, um, his, his hand on his head because he is obviously in despair of what his SNP colleagues have said about this Citizens' Assembly. Oh, well, thank, thank you very kindly. Uh, there are a number of reasons why I believe that this Citizens' Assembly is tainted. Um, by the SNP's agenda. First of all, Nicola Sturgeon announced the Assembly alongside cross-party constitutional discussions and Indyref legis two reg legislation back in April. And that was a, uh, her part of uh, her push to um, bring back another independence agenda. And this has been lambasted by former MEP David Martin as a mistake and criticised uh, the, de the decision by the First Minister to include this Citizens' Assembly with independence referendum legislation. That's point one. SNP, MSPs and MPs really let the cat out of the bag before the Assembly got off the ground. We've heard today that Joanne Cherry, MP, calling the newly announced Citizens' Assembly the perfect way towards independence. This commentary from the SNP has destroyed what could have been a simplistic, democratic and transparent process. We had Mike Russell saying Scotland has a fundamental choice to make about its future when it comes to Citizens' Assemblies. Well, we did, Mr Russell. We voted no in 2014, and your government lost their majority in 2016. I'll just make a little bit of progress, Mr Arthur. Moreover, a prominent academic, Dr Escobar, involved with the Assembly, has expressed his anger at Joanna Cherry. It seems there is a trend here. In response to Cherry's claims about the Assembly, Dr Oliver Escobar, who was involved in, involved in organising the Assembly, said he was kind of fuming at the statement believing Cherry had made the forums work ten times harder. Maybe Ms Cherry had wished she had stayed quiet about this. That's point two. And on top of these bloopers, it's going to cost the taxpayer half a million pounds to fund. Many will be rightly furious that the government is spending on this direction of travel uh, as it, uh, it has been experienced from the comments from the SNP politicians. I'll give way... Bruce Crawford. The member would tell us what role Joanna Cherry has in the Scottish Government. Well, Joanna, Rachel Hamilton. <laughs> well, it, do you know that Joanna Cherry, I, I'm not sure if you know, but Joanna Cherry is a member of uh, the SNP party. Uh, she, has a, she, she has a role to play. Well, um, she, is, she has made her comments and she has put the scepticism into the, the public and that has uh, caused an issue with transparency and fairness regarding this, because we are not against the concept of citizens' assemblies. The questions up for debate are not set by this citizens' assembly itself. They are set by the SNP government. The First Minister set out three broad questions, as we heard from Mike Russell. And forgive me for my suspicion, but these questions have nothing to do with fixing the government's domestic record and everything to do with the constitution. It's nothing to do with, for example, reducing the deficit in Scotland. Um, it has nothing to do with declining NHS performance or fewer teachers in our school. What I would like to see, and many of my colleagues would like to see a Citizens' Assembly do, is discuss how better we can reach a zero carbon economy, how better we can deliver climate change, and the list goes on. To draw together these points, it may be argued, presiding officer, the real Citizens' Assembly is here in this Scottish Parliament. Across the Chamber, there are many people of all political persuasions, from all walks of life, different backgrounds, from different professions and different life experiences. We are elected to represent our constituents. We stand up for them in this Chamber every day. However, we should remain open-minded about the concept of Citizens' Assemblies. To conclude, people are highly suspicious about the motives of the SNP. They want a Citizens' Assembly because it has been and will always be about independence. Simply put, presiding officer, it is a talking shop for independence and very little else. How can that opinion be turned around? Will it seek the views of people 
on how the SNP have dismantled local frontline policing, leading to an increase in crime. No, thank you, Mr Arthur. Will it seek the views of people on how to reverse the SNP's failing on school standards? Will it seek the views of people on how rural areas are becoming increasingly more isolated in a technologically advancing world? It is a matter of deep regret that what potentially could have been a good idea has been tainted. Using assemblies has been effective in other countries. It just seems that the SNP's incurable narrowness of their constitutional agenda has destroyed what could have demonstrated a new way forward to reflect public opinion. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Interesting contributions from the Conservative benches. Uh, Adam Tompkins uh, saying that we do not have all the answers uh, here in this Parliament, and I agree with him. And Rachel Hamilton now saying that uh, this Parliament is the Citizens' Assembly. Fundamentally different points of view. So there's obviously a difference of point of view in the Tory party. In the SNP, we have robust debates and ways of dealing uh, with different points of view. But I think the thing I want to start with is the character and experience of the convener. I know one of them, I don't know the other. Uh, David Martin, when he was uh, first elected as an MEP, in the 1980s, he came into the Bank of Scotland to meet some of the senior executives. And I remember sitting around the lunch table because we were hospitable to David Martin uh, to hear the questions that he had and the responses he had uh, to the issues that he was raising with us in the Bank of Scotland. So that's more than 30 years ago. So the one thing that David Martin brings to the table is objectivity. The second thing he brings to the table is experience. And the third thing that he brings to the table is a man who's honest in his political opinions. And they are not my political opinions. They are political opinions that come from a different tradition. So if we attack the Citizens' Assembly, we attack David Martin and his substantial record of public service and his preparedness to serve the public good and to serve the democratic deficit that there undoubtedly is the democratic emergency that there is in these islands. Today's court judgment is just one part of a continuing failure of the democratic systems in the UK as a whole uh, to solve major problems. Now, on climate change, I absolutely support the proposal that's come from the Green benches and been supportive from the Conservative benches uh, that we need to involve citizens more in the issue of uh, climate change. I took the bill forward in 2009 and we had unanimous support then. I hope again uh, we will do so here. But we're in an era of post-truth politics. Climate change is an issue. Globalization is a matter of debate. Our citizens have to be part of deciding our future. Now, in this, who is actually taking the risk by establishing the Citizens' Assembly? We in this parliament have a majority in favor of independence. But we, who support that particular objective, part of a wider agenda, not standing on its own, we are taking the risk that this Citizens' Assembly, independent of government, chaired by someone who's been a lifelong opponent of the political uh, philosophy that I espouse, can come up with a conclusion which will make me desperately uncomfortable. Now, I happen to believe uh, that we will have convincing evidence and arguments that will lead them to a different place. But we are the ones taking the risk, those of us who support Scottish independence. The fact that the Tories will not take such risks, the fact that the Liberal Democrats will make, not take such risks, is very revealing indeed. So, uh, can, uh, presiding officer, we have an opportunity to recalibrate the way our democracy works. The, what is in front of uh, uh, the, the, the Citizens' Assembly lays out the way they can, they can address issues, but they are masters of their own destiny. The Liberal uh, Democrat Amendment uh, does not disagree with the remit in terms of the Assembly. I invite them to endorse them in their concluding remarks. And of course, the word independence appears nowhere in it. The UK's relationship with the devolved nations in general is changing and indeed within England 
there are huge tensions across the geography and different experiences of people in different parts of England. So citizens' assemblies can be an important part of allowing countries to consider uh, how they take themselves forward. In Ireland, the removal of the Eighth uh, Amendment to the Constitution was a suitable place for the Citizens' Assembly to contribute to the subsequent debate in the referendum. And very successful it was indeed. The referendum followed closely the recommendations of the Assembly. But more to the point, participants said that it made them consider the impacts of a proposal in ways they would never considered before. That's important, to rely on the deep reflections of fellow citizens who come without the baggage that every single one of us here as a party politician inevitably has. It brings honesty and openness to the deliberative process. And I congratulate our friends in Ireland showing us the way to reignite uh, thoughtful uh, dialogue. Um, it's worth uh, just briefly mentioning this issue of Brexit itself. If we had, in essence, three years ago, taken forward the post-2016 referendum deliberations via a citizens' assembly, I think we would have not got ourselves tied into the cul-de-sac that was laid down by the Prime Minister in January 2017, which has contributed to the failure of the political system to come to any meaningful conclusion. Uh, presiding officer, this is not really a debate about the government, the proposals from the government for an assembly. It's actually about the credibility of David Marson, a man I've often disagreed with, but I continue to respect. Claire Baker, followed by John McAlpine. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This afternoon does give us an opportunity to consider the Citizens' Assembly in more detail. For well, the publication of a remit in August and the Memorandum for Understanding, which was published earlier this week, there has been limited opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny of the proposal. And this afternoon gives some opportunity to explore the issues involved in establishing a Citizens' Assembly. As others have said, when the First Minister announced plans for a Citizens' Assembly, Scottish Labour gave a cautious welcome to the news. It is regrettable that the Scottish Government did not bring the proposal at an earlier stage to Parliament. In Ireland, cross-party consensus was achieved through parliamentary scrutiny and the ability to consider and amend the remit. I have previously highlighted concerns regarding the nature of the announcement as part of wider plans to pursue a second independence referendum, which risks faith in the process. While the memorandum that was published this week emphasises the independence of the Assembly, it remains to be seen whether or not the government's ambition for another referendum is the intended purpose of the Assembly, though I hear the government's assurances on this this afternoon. The inclusion in the remit of a specific role regarding the options for constitutional reform does little to dispel these concerns, and there is a job of work for the Assembly to consider how they will approach this discussion and what direction this will lead them. We are at the stage of handing over this, the process to the Citizens' Assembly and it must be for them to set their own agenda. Deliberative democracy can be a valuable approach to questions which face a society and its future. It can be used to engage citizens in what is seemingly intractable problems or questions that have the potential to cause division in communities. Involving the public more directly in the democratic process is something we should all support as parliamentarians. We have seen examples of citizens' assemblies in Poland, Canada, Ireland and Australia, providing opportunities for participatory democracy and addressing a range of issues, from reducing fossil fuel use to the reform of the abortion law. Providing a forum, a structure and time for members of the public to hear evidence, to challenge what is put before them and to question experts, these assemblies can also contribute to wider knowledge and understanding if engagement with the broader population is secured. Um, I attended the sessions involving representatives from Ireland, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for arranging that, uh, where we heard about their experiences. And we can learn a lot from those countries that have already been through the process. In setting up our assembly, we must provide an opportunity for assembly members, as representatives of the wider population, to determine which areas they want to focus on. And while the remit that, the, that was published um, last month is broad, it is for the assembly to decide where they wish to focus. So moving on to consider the progress of the work, 
While the recent publication of the remit is a welcome step towards the first meeting in late October, I note that the Citizens' Assembly website information still indicates some areas in which decisions are yet to be made. Among these are critical decisions on the best way to involve the wider public in the process and how exactly the Assembly will operate, including live streaming of content beyond deliberative sessions. Decisions also need to be taken on whether access will be provided for observers and the media. Key to all of this is a need to balance the public interest and transparency with the legitimate need for protection of the privacy of Assembly members. Recruitment of 100 plus members is underway, but it is far from a straightforward task. And I understand that in Ireland, the percentage that agreed to take part was quite small and it was quite an onerous um, task. There are also some issues with retention as the model in Ireland rolled out. Aside from balancing the membership in line with the broader population, those taking part need to be convinced of the argument that providing their time and participation over a number of weeks is a worthwhile task for them and the contribution that they can make to society. Um, I have another number of other questions the Cabinet Secretary may wish to address. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary give advice on what assurances are being provided to members of the public that their privacy will be safeguarded if they take part in the Assembly? And has a decision been made about what information about participants will be made public? In Ireland, uh, names and broad geographical locations of members were published following the Assembly. Can I ask, will streamed footage include the Assembly members? Some Assembly members will have social media accounts and are steps being taken to ensure that they are not contacted or otherwise targeted via these and other routes that could influence the contributions. We also need to think about potential for harassment or abuse if participants are identified and the need to support them more generally through the period of meetings and beyond. So can I ask what measures have been put in place to support these members through the process in terms of pastoral care? As others have recognised, we do live in a time where heightened emotions are too often linked to political and social debate. We need to ensure that the Assembly is respectful and that we as a society respect the role that they are carrying out. We also need to consider how to ensure participants will be able to speak openly and freely within the Assembly, including views that they might not feel comfortable airing in an open forum. For example, will there be an option for them to submit their views through um, anonymously or through a proxy speaker? Um, the fact that participants will be recompensed for giving up their weekends is welcome and I um, should hopefully provide some incentive to those who might not consider involvement otherwise. There is a desire to include those who are not in employment, so can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the arrangements of this as a gift payment means that it will not affect people who are currently receiving benefits? As evidenced by the outcomes of the Citizens' Assembly, which has taken place around the world, there is much we can gain from this process. I look forward to the work of the Citizens' Assembly. We must recognise the timescales we are working to are very challenging and as a lot of being asked of the people who have agreed to take part. The principles of transparency and access must be balanced with appropriate support and protection of privacy for members of the public who become involved. It is, has the potential to act as a stimulus for wider public engagement and discussion and I hope it can help raise the level of debate to address the challenges we face as a country in the coming years. John McAlpine, followed by Graham Simpson. Thank you. I wanted to concentrate my remarks today on the impartial nature of the Citizens' Assembly and in particular how the structures underpinning it are designed to deliver that impartiality. First and most importantly, the Assembly is independent of government and it will set its own agenda within its remit. And leadership will set the tone here. And I hope we can all agree that the conveners are both impartial and respected people. That's critically important with regards to impartiality because the conveners will also sign off the final membership profile. I'm fortunate in having had some contact with both the conveners in the course of my parliamentary work. Kate Wimpress has addressed the cross-party group on culture, which I convene in her role as director of North Edinburgh Arts, a very successful community-focused project using creative people's skill sets to improve and deepen the engagement of local people in shaping the places where they live. And Kate brings that expertise to her role as chair of Scotland's Regeneration Forum SURF, which again promotes innovation and engagement. And that strikes me as an excellent background for the convener of a citizens assembly designed to do the same thing in terms of political engagement. I've also been fortunate to engage with co-convener 
uh, David Martin, who has given evidence to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, which I convene. And my earliest memory of David, who is Scotland's longest serving MEP, was back in the 1990s, when the Herald newspaper gave a lot of space to his promotion of the Europe of the regions, then an idea very much in its infancy. And those of us who supported independence uh, in Europe for Scotland at that time, I have to say we're not too enamoured of David's ideas um, at the time, uh, believing um, that only a seat at the top table in Europe was good enough for Scotland. And I say that not to drag up the past, but to emphasise that David is his own man and has always been his own man and is certainly not someone who could ever be accused of being told what to do by the SNP. David, as has been said, was a Scottish Labour member of the European Parliament for 35 years and he's the Parliament's uh, formerly the Parliament's longest serving Vice President and of course Professor of Public Policy at the University of Glasgow. We're very lucky to have both David and Kate in these roles and I would hope that nobody in this Parliament would ever question their impartiality. In addition to these conveners, we have an impartial and arm's length secretariat appointed to the Assembly and critically the secretariat will be located outside Scottish Government offices and made up of civil servants who will adhere to the Civil Service Code and take their direction from and be accountable to the impartial conveners. The most important element of the Assembly is its members and again the focus here is ensuring that they're completely independent. An independent contractor will identify participants and provide the Secretariat with a list of members. And I note that the Memorandum of Understanding says Scottish Ministers will have no involvement with this element of the delivery of the contract. That Memorandum of Understanding also sets out clearly that the members are in the driving seat of this whole process. According to the remit of the Assembly, it will, quote, decide for itself which challenges it wants to consider, examine the current constitutional arrangements for dealing with those challenges and the options for constitutional reform and set out what further work is required to provide the information that would allow the people of Scotland to make an informed choice about the future of the country. All these impartial people, the members, the conveners, the secretariat, will be assisted in their work by expert groups. And Mary Lafoy, the chairperson of the Irish Citizen Assembly, referenced the role of these expert groups in her Michael Littleton Memorial Lecture delivered last year. Um, and she said, I truly believe that their involvement, the expert group's involvement in the process and in helping myself and the Secretariat navigate through some of the most complex and challenging issues facing Irish society is one of the most noteworthy features of this process. Uh, that is the collaboration with academia, professionals and administrators is something which is of benefit to the whole work of the Assembly. But if the independence of the conveners, members, secretariat, contractor and expert groups still doesn't satisfy, there's an additional layer of scrutiny to ensure impartiality and that is the politicians panel and it means that the Assembly members, if they choose, can summon all the parties of this Parliament, even those oppos opposing the motion today. I would therefore like to end by quoting a politician, the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who wrote favourably about citizens' assemblies in The Guardian earlier this year. Mr Brown said they offer a fresh opportunity to invite more people into the decision-making process in a more structured and constructive way. So my message to those who oppose the motion today is to heed the words of Gordon Brown. Abandon your cynicism and place your faith in the impeccable impartiality of the Assembly and its conveners. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on Graeme Simpson to be followed by David Torrance. Graeme Simpson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, following on from uh, Joe McAlpine's uh, measured co contribution, I have to um, confess that I am a, a, a cynic uh, in general, actually. Uh, and I'm... Uh, Certainly, um, certainly cynical of government, um, all governments, um, because they all play the same games. And you, and, and you have to, uh, when, you, when you have an idea like setting up a citizens' assembly, you have to think, well, what, what are they up to? Um, but you don't have to look very far in, in this case, because we know what they're up to. It's in the, the remit. It's all about cost, Scotland's constitutional future. And listening to... Uh, the debate, and I genuinely came into this um, 
with, uh, with an open mind. Um, uh, no, I, I, I did. Um, and and I've, I've heard things that I, di I didn't realize. Um, and I now uh, tend to the view that uh, citizens' assemblies can be a good thing. And that's uh, uh, involving people was something I always felt very strongly about when I was a councillor for, for 10 years. Um, and seeing, uh, seeing the way councils operated, that wasn't always the view of councils. They, uh, you know, they thought they knew best, as governments often think they know best. Uh, but I think it's a good thing um, if we ask people what they think. Uh, what I think is a shame uh, is the way this has been done. Uh, and I think the contributions that we've heard so far um, that have said that we should have chosen different subjects to start this off would have been a much better idea. There are serious issues that a citizens' assembly should be looking at. Climate change is one. Adam Tompkins uh, mentioned the, the drug crisis. They would be serious issues that a citizens' assembly could look at. Um, one misconception, I think, around this is that this is a permanent body. It's not. It sits for, it's only sitting for six meetings. It's only to look at the Constitution. Um, and then it's presumably scrapped, it reports and it's scrapped and then you set something else up if you want to do uh, another citizen assembly on another issue. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, not necessarily be the case. Uh, it could be certainly true that different membership was found, but if proposals come forward, and I indicated my opening speech, there's already a proposal which the government has accepted in terms of climate change. There may be other proposals. So, for example, uh, there are difficult social issues that may require uh, this type of approach. So it's not necessarily the case, but I see the member's enthusiasm for citizens' assembly beginning to get going, so I would welcome his uh, contribution on ideas for one. Graham Simpson. Well, Mr. Mr. Russell uh, knows I'm a measured man. Um, he can uh, come and speak to me uh, any time he likes. Um, I am concerned, however, uh, that there appears to be no budget for this particular citizens' assembly. Uh, we've heard it could cost up to half a million pounds. Uh, Mr. Russell, when he stood up, uh, couldn't confirm that, couldn't tell us what the, the figure was. I think that is, uh, that is a matter of concern. Uh, that should come through the Parliament uh, at some point. It should be budgeted for. Uh, the members of the assembly uh, are being chosen at the moment, uh, we've heard about the co-conveners. I'm afraid I don't know either of them, so I've really got no views on either of them, but I'm sure they'll do their very best. Uh, in a breezy blog signed Kate and David, however, they said, we've been busy getting to know each other and getting up to speed with the range of work required to deliver the assembly. There can be few roles more worthwhile than helping our citizens seek common ground couldn't really disagree with that. But I think if we look at the, the remit of this particular assembly, and this remit is set by government, Mr. Russell um, touched on the three questions uh, that the assembly will uh, look at, uh, and, one, and Brexit is mentioned, education isn't mentioned, health isn't mentioned, drugs isn't mentioned. It said it's there to consider examine the current constitutional arrangements for dealing with those challenges and the options for constitutional reform. And within this remit, the Assembly will decide its own agenda. Um, but that remit is set by government. So without, uh, outside of that, it can do nothing. So it is, uh, and it does appear to be um, a, a bit of a stunt at the moment for independence. So while I'm not against the idea of a citizen assembly. I do regret the way this has been set up. Willie Rennie um, uh, asked a question in a previous session. What would happen if this particular assembly came out against independence? What would Mike Russell and the government do? What would their response be to that? We haven't had an answer to that. Perhaps when the cabinet secretary uh, sums up, well, it's up to the presiding Very officer. Yeah. It, it was in the opening speech. All the recommendations of the Assembly will come to this Parliament. The Parliament will vote on them. If the Parliament were to accept those recommendations, the government would bring forward the recommendations it's bound to do so. It would do that no matter the recommendations. It is entirely clear. Graham Simpson. 
Uh, no, I haven't, because I'm not uh, quite sure I buy that. Um, I, think, um, I think if the uh, Citizens' Assembly uh, came out against independence, uh, it would be roundly rejected, and we may not have another one. My time is up, Presiding Officer. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Simpson. And I call on uh, David Torrance before we move to winding up speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the UK Parliament has been shut down by a Tory government at a critical time. Their actions have today been declared illegal. Even before we did that, we are at the height of the greatest constitutional crisis faced by the United Kingdom since the Irish independence 100 years ago. The move was both reckless and sinister. The shutdown of democracy was sought by a Prime Minister who is a leader of a party which does not command a majority in the House of Commons and who was installed as Prime Minister without any democratic mandate. Meanwhile, in Scotland, we are busy finding ways of improving our democracy and welcome the first meeting of a new Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, which will be held next month. The key features of Assembly are independence from government, transparency, inclusion, access, balance, cumulative learning and open-mindedness. To me, all of these principles are admirable, but I would like to dwell on the final one, open-mindedness. The Assembly is a forum for open-minded deliberation between participants, ensuring that the public sees it as a genuine process of inquiry and to help ensure that it receives an open-minded response from this Parliament and the Scottish Government. That statement is taken from the Assembly's own mission statement. It emphasises the Assembly's separate identity and its independence from Parliament and Government. A Citizens' Assembly is not a new concept. Citizens' Assemblies have been set up in many other countries, Ireland close to home, and British Columbia on the other side of the world, to name but two. It means we are looking for best practice in other parts of the world, and then important and adopting it to use in our own political system. We are outward looking. Transparency is another key feature of this assembly, but what will this mean in practice? Will it be applied to all levels of the assembly? It has been applied to the selection of assembly members. With 100 members from all across Scotland have been randomly selected to represent representative of the adult population in terms of their age, gender, educational qualifications, ethnic group, geography and political attitudes. Transparency will apply to its proceedings and will be live streamed so that we can all observe for ourselves if you wish. No, thank you. Transparency will be an important element in demonstrating the Assembly's independence from the Parliament and from the Scottish Government. It is vital to ascend this credibility for independence to be clear for all to see. And I strongly believe that the critics and cynics will be excited at the prospect of finding reasons to dismiss, dismiss the Assembly's workings and outcomes. No thank you, something new and progressive, which is transparent and independent, will not be popular in some quarters. I was delighted to see former... No thank you. I was delighted to see former MEP David Martin appointed as one of the Assembly conveners. I hope his knowledge of political institutions in the UK and at the EU level and other EU member states will turn out to be a huge asset to the workings of the Assembly. The appointment of someone from outside po politics, Kate Wimpress, as other convener, will I hope create a balance of approach, of expertise and experience between the Assembly's two conveners. The Assembly's independence is enshrined in its own memorandum of understanding with the Scottish Government, so its conveners and members will be confident of their freedom to follow their own path within the Assembly's terms of remit. Needless to say, our exercise in widening democracy has not been welcomed by all in these chambers. That brings me back to UK event, recent events at the UK Parliament. One reason the UK is in such a current mess is the choice of one particular party to pursue its own party interests over Brexit, when the interest is directly opposite to national interests. Had that party chosen an inclusive approach to all Brexit issues, putting the national interests first, our current political landscape would be totally different. In conclusion, presiding officer, Inclusion is one of the key features of our new Assembly. All the political parties rep represented in this Parliament will be supporters amongst the members of the Assembly. So with that in mind, I would urge everyone in the Chamber to be forward-thinking and embrace opportunities offered by the Citizens' Assembly. Thank you very much. We move now to winding up speeches. I call Willie Rennie to open for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, the thank Liberal you, Democrats. President Officer. The idea was simple. Elegant addition to our democracy. But the SNP has now stomped all over it, politicised it, and make it look falsely like a propaganda unit. Not my words, not my words, the words of Neil Mackay 
independent supporter and exactly the words that Adam Tonkins used and quite rightly used because this man is an avid supporter of citizens' assemblies. He sees the greater good that can come from the citizens' assembly and he is embarrassed, in fact, ashamed that the party that he has supported, that has advanced independence, could treat this precious, this precious instrument in such a manner. And I think that is the fundamental problem that we have with the approach of the SNP government. I think it's also unfortunate today that there's been a personalisation of the debate. Both Mike Russell and Bruce Crawford sought to undermine Joanna Cherry and her role in this debate. I feel the need to stand up for Joanna Cherry. <laughs> if they won't stand up for her, I think it's upon us to stand up. But she brought honesty. She brought integrity to this debate by revealing the true purpose of the Citizens' Assembly, which was to advance the debate. And they're shouting again. I will stand up for Joanna Cherry. She's done a great service to this country, and I think we owe her a debt of gratitude. I think it's also ridiculous to suggest that those who criticise the way that the SNP has gone about the Citizens' Assembly is somehow undermining David Martin. That is an atrocious way to approach this debate. And in fact, it shows how weak the case is that the SNP has developed, that they have sought to claim that somehow I personally am attacking David Martin personally. That is not the case. I, no, not just now, the, the gentleman who's trying to make an intervention was particularly unpleasant in his approach to this debate this afternoon by claiming that I was attacking David Martin. In no way whatsoever were any of us seeking to do that. And that is the unfortunate bit of this debate because, because, their, argument, because their argument is so weak, because their argument is so weak, they have sought to personalise it. And I think we should have nothing to do with that approach. Alex Rowley has agreed that Joanna Cherry has muddied the water, as he put it. But then he seems to have ignored the evidence that she has provided, which is that the SNP are seeking to use this just to advance the independence debate. And I hope, I hope he comes to see that that is the case, because we have heard on numerous occasions that the SNP try this trick every single time. What's wrong with a debate? What's wrong with having another discussion, a national conversation, say, right across the country? We can have the taxpayer paying for SNP ministers yeah. to book halls out in every part of the country so we can have another debate about independence. That was their first attempt at trying to engineer this debate right back when they gained power in 2007. And we've had endless debates ever since. Ever since we had the three-year-long independence debate, which they lost. We had the white paper. We had a debate about the legislation for the referendum. We have had subsequently, we've had Andrew Wilson's report into the economic impact on the future of Scotland and independence. We are encouraged to participate in all of these debates. It's endless. And you can therefore forgive us for being a wee bit bored, for wanting to move on, to try talk about something else, perhaps the Brexit crisis, for instance. Maybe we could try and deal with that problem. No, I'm not going to take an intervention. So therefore, I think it's deeply regrettable that the principle, the deeply held principle by many that Citizens' Assembly can do great things, is being undermined today. Because it can do great things. If you look at some of the proposals that have come forward today alone, there's been the talk about having a Citizens' Assembly on drug deaths. I think that would be particularly valid to have that debate. I think we could bring together people from all parts of society to have that discussion. The one I proposed earlier on, around about climate change, trying to get people to understand the need for personal behavioural change in order to meet our challenges on the climate. Perhaps on closing the attainment gap. That might be a useful thing to have a discussion about, how we can involve parents and pupils, people right across society so we can close that attainment gap. The SNP government have failed so far, so maybe it's time for somebody else to try and come up uh, with some ideas. And of course, the social care challenge, massive challenges on social care. Let's get people involved in that discussion. All of those things would come way before yet another boring discussion about independence, because that's all that the SNP 
seem to be interested. No, I'm in my final few seconds. The Citizens' Assembly was announced by the First Minister as part of a package of measures to achieve independence. That is without doubt. The Assembly, the cross-party talks, and the unstoppable legislation on another referendum. Mike Russell even managed to keep a straight face when it would be free from vested interests, <laughs> even though it only exists as part of the independence package. The minister set up the assembly, recruited the conveners, allowed them to make speeches on the assembly, designed the remit, and then said it was up to the assembly to decide for itself what it wanted to do. No, it's not. The First Minister, her, First Minister has never said, full steam ahead for independence, subject to the conclusions of the Citizens' Assembly. Never said that. Those words never passed their lips. Because the truth is, the SNP are using this as another wheeze to try and get independence. But we will not be fooled. Thank you, Nicole. Alex Rowley to be followed by Donald Cameron. Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. This debate has been interesting, but in, in, in many ways disappointing, but, but reflects perhaps where we are in Scotland, because anybody that's been living in Scotland these last five years uh, could not deny that the question of the Constitution overarches all areas uh, policy within Scotland and we do need to find a way forward and we do need to be asking questions about the best way forward. And what I would say is Labour is clear that, that we are taking the government at face value, we are engaging in this process, we will engage in the discussions on the way forward, but this Citizens Assembly is the first national assembly to have been created across the United Kingdom. The first one to be properly resourced and, 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 and organised in, in, in such a way to, to, to be effective. And I believe the eyes internationally, people will be looking at this assembly. So the idea is, as, as Graham Simpson put it, that it's a bit of a stunt for independence. Well, if that turns out to be the case, then I believe that will be exposed. But I do believe that the principle that's set out here is right. And yes, we, in future, if we get this right, can use such a mechanism to look at some of the difficult issues, not just drugs death in Scotland, but drugs policy, which seems to me to be far outdated, failing and continuing to fail. Uh, so so, so there, are, there are other issues, but I do think we need to look at the way we move forward and be positive. The concerns be Willie Rennie and, 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 and the, 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 the uh, Professor Tompkins around independence, I would have to say to you that the greatest threat to the future of the United Kingdom does not lie in the Scottish Citizens' Assembly. The greatest threat right now to the future of the United Kingdom lies with the Conservative and Brexit Party and Boris Johnson. That's, that's, that's a fact. Even, even his brother, Joe Johnson, resigned for his government saying that he had to choose between family loyalty and what's best and what's right for the country. So, you know, the idea that a Citizens' Assembly can, can, can threat over that threat. So if you really are interested in the future of the United Kingdom, then you really need to start to stand up to Boris Johnson and tell him that he's not on, that, that he's damaging the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mike uh, Rumbles. Sorry, I was... No. Yeah. Mike Rumbles. You, sorry, the member seems to have bought uh, the SNP government's uh, motivation for this, but he doesn't seem to accept that it even could be possibly independence. I'm just thinking, you know, if he's bought that, I've got a bridge to sell him. Alex Rowley. The, the point that, that um, Stuart Stevenson made, I think, was a good point, where he talked about having taken the risk and the confidence that he had in his arguments. I'm very confident in the arguments, if you want to argue about the future of Scotland, I'm, I'm very confident that the economic case for independence just does not stack up in any shape or form. I'm confident that we can take forward the arguments and win those arguments just as Stuart's confident in the arguments that he has. But I would say this to you, don't confuse that with arguing for the status quo because right now Scotland 
every region and nation of the United Kingdom is being let down by Westminster, by the Tory and Brexit party, who have become obsessed, obsessed with Brexit. Uh, I'm confident in my arguments. If you were confident in yours, perhaps you would come to this assembly and work with the other parties to find the best way forward for Scotland. Reform, re remain and reform in Europe, remain and reform in the United Kingdom has to be, has to be the way forward. Yeah. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, does the member remember that in 2011, the Liberal Democrats caused us to have a referendum on proportional uh, elections? Only 10 out of 440 areas voted in favour. But Vince Cable, in July this year, says we should have a citizens' assembly. The issue is not closed by that referendum. Why should any other be closed? Alex Rowley. Well, I also, also remember that in 2010, Willie Rennie's Liberal Democrats did a deal with the Tories and as a result of that what did we get? Welfare reform that has created widespread poverty across Scotland and the United Kingdom. If you want to ask why people went out and voted for Brexit, look at the levels of poverty that was created by a Liberal Tory government in Westminster. Uh, the bedroom tax. Uh, attack, attacks, attacks on, on never seen before. So, so I, I really think that, that Willie might be trying to, to appeal to a certain group of people in Scotland. But the reality is your party and the Tories have created the situation that we find ourselves in and the levels of poverty that are unacceptable. Uh, a number of people have mentioned about the... the, the the co-conveners, I don't know Kate Wimpress, but she certainly has an impressive uh, CV. And David Martin, I know very well. I know David Martin's offered to meet with all parties to have a discussion around these issues, at least in the, 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 the spirit of trying to find the best way forward for Scotland. I would urge you to meet with the co-conveners and share your concerns with them and hear what they have to say. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary. Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate. When the Cabinet Secretary announced the creation of the Citizens' Assembly back in June, my colleague Adam Tompkins said that there is a role for Citizens' Assemblies, particularly when it comes to aspects of public policy that a parliamentary democracy has failed or is struggling to address and resolve. And the Cabinet Secretary himself said that democracy does not stand still and we have to keep innovating in order to keep moving. But I couldn't agree more with both of those points. They're valid and substantial. And I concur with many of the sentiments made by others across the chamber who have spoken about examples of citizens' assemblies elsewhere, most notably in Ireland, which have been real drivers behind significant social change. The Scottish Conservatives are by no means against both the premise and the principle behind such institutions being created and the role they may have in using a unique model of public discourse to drive reform. We fully support local democracy and devolving power from this place to more local democratic bodies. And I'm sure that both David Martin and Kate Wimpress, uh, the co conveners I don't know them personally, but they seem to enjoy uh, respect across uh, the political spectrum, will work diligently alongside a committed group of representatives from across Scottish society. It's not the principle we object to, but the process because it has been abundantly clear from the outset that the manner in which the government has proceeded has been short-sighted, to say the least. Despite warm words from the Cabinet Secretary, there is a justified suspicion that the Assembly's creation has been fundamentally designed to do one thing, which is to further the independence agenda. And when Joanna Cherry calls it the perfect way, the perfect way to advance independence, then it was always always going to be a tough sell to the Scottish public as a fair and balanced forum to lead a conversation about Scotland's future. And earlier in the year, when he announced the creation of the Assembly, the Cabinet Secretary preached consensus amongst political parties when it came to such assemblies. But he also mentioned Brexit nine times and independence twice in that statement, as well as being critical of the UK government. There was a hint of it again today. And the Assembly was announced alongside the referendum legislation and the cross-party talks. And therein lies the problem, because even at its birth, this has proved to be 
a partisan endeavor. And David Martin was right. He called this a mistake. Throwing the three things together created suspicion. Suspicion is his word. No one minds the rough and tumble of party politics in this place. Of course not. But it was really unwise, in my view, in our view, to launch this project in such a context. You cannot preach consensus on the one hand and at the same time push a deeply divisive policy yeah. on the other. Can I move on to discuss the remit of the Assembly which the government has published? My own disappointment centres not on what is included but what is omitted. There's no mention of how we should improve Scotland schools, no mention of how we should reform our NHS for the long term, no mention of how we invest in infrastructure. Other MSPs have raised a number of different issues that could have been addressed by the Citizens' Assembly. Willie Rennie raised the climate emergency. But what about economic regeneration? We know, for example, that the UK economy is expected to grow faster than the Scottish economy over the next four years. It would have been intriguing to hear views about that. What about the total number of teachers falling in our classrooms? Serious day-to-day -day issues crying out for new and innovative solutions which the Citizens' Assembly could have addressed and how much more invigorating would it have been if the Scottish Government had tasked the Assembly to focus on bread and butter everyday issues and not the Constitution. Deliberative democracy is suited to these kind of matters rather than polarising constitutional issues. And as others have pointed out, I think it was Graham Simpson who said that given it will only meet over six weekends and no more, it does beg the question of what, could realistically, um, what, it, what it could realistically offer this Parliament in terms of a vision for the future? Yes, of course. I'm Arthur. I'm very grateful uh, for the member uh, giving way. And I would just note that the first aspect of the remit is, is what kind of country are we seeking to build, which is very broad. Could the member suggest how that particular remit precludes a discussion of any of the domestic or bread and butter issues that he referred to? Donald Cameron. Except it's broad. I, I, I think the remit has a narrow focus. And there are many people, both in and more importantly outside this chamber, who do need convincing that it will be more than just a talking shop for constitutional change. So, presiding officer, in summing up, I want to turn to a few of the remarks that colleagues across this chamber have made during this debate. Adam Tompkins and Graham Simpson were right to say that we should have started off with perhaps different topics. I want to concentrate on something that Angela Constance said, um, because she was right, in my view, to say that this parliament is lacking in diversity and that there are voices in Scotland which we do not hear and which need to be heard. And I hope if the Citizens' Assembly achieves one thing, that it reaches those people. And I fully accept what she said. To conclude, our view, presiding officer, is that this can be a worthwhile exercise, but we remain concerned that it has been tainted from the beginning. I hope I am proved wrong. I hope this Assembly does eventually tackle some of the day-to-day -day issues that, we, that I've spoken about. We can all agree that it's time to remove some of the poison, some of the vitriol that infects our politics. A Citizens' Assembly would have been the ideal way to do this. But when a senior SNP figure calls such a body the perfect way to advance the independence agenda, then how can we approach this consensually? And more importantly, how can it have a transformational impact on public policy? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary, to conclude our debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I come to the substance of this debate, could I just correct a, a misapprehension that appears to have arisen? A, a number of members have referenced Ireland and have referenced the uh, Constitutional, the, the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, but the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland, uh, which dealt with, amongst other issues, the abortion issue that did deal with other issues, was the second deliberative democracy innovation in Ireland. The first one, the Constitutional Convention, took for a, a number of years to set up. It was in the end passed by the Doyle uh, without dissent, but it took a long time to get to that position. So the argument that says there was some outpouring of agreement at the very beginning simply isn't true. Nor is the fact that the first of those bodies looked solely at social issues. In fact, if you look up the remit of the first constitutional convention, that is, the Citizens' Assembly, you discover number one was reducing the presidential term of office. Number two was reducing the voting age. Number three was the re review of the Doyle electoral system. Number four was giving residents outside the state the right to vote. So the first uh, step in Ireland in these matters were constitutional issues which were not able to be resolved by the Doyle itself. 
So I think far from departing from what we are told is the Irish model, we're actually being remarkably consistent with the Irish model. And I think that should be borne in mind, particularly when we consider future assemblies. Because I take it, I take at face value the members who've said that they want to have future assemblies. Only one party has come up with a proposal for a future assembly, and I'll come to that in a moment. But if there are to be future assemblies, we might learn from that model too. So we need to move on. And the abortion one was a, a also a constitutional issue because it was addressing the constitutional ban on abortion. So I think you know, members who talk about social policy, who talk about using this in a certain way, need to focus on that model, which uh, you know, I'll come to Claire Baker's point in a moment. You know, we brought over from Ireland people with experience of this to have that conversation. Some of those who've been most critical did not take part in those discussions. But look at the actual history. Don't make it up. Now, there's two positions you could take on this afternoon's uh, debate, presiding officer. Uh, one would be that, uh, frankly, it is a pessimistic view. You would come away deeply depressed at how closed some minds are and how deep the divisions are, which are impervious to argument or reason. But you could come away with a more optimistic view, which says, in an actual fact, what this debate has proved is that we need not just a citizens' assembly, but this citizens' assembly as more than ever. Because we need to find a way to debate these major issues without the type of rhetoric and division that we have heard this afternoon. But let me go back to the issues within the remit, because these are the issues that we're trying to look at. What kind of country are we seeking? How best we can overcome the challenges that Scotland and the world face in the 21st century, including those arising from Brexit, and what further work should be carried out to give us the information we need to make the informed choices. It seems to me that if you were to perhaps just step back and read the official report of this tomorrow or the next day, you might come to the conclusion that the Citizens' Assembly is precisely the means by which the divided membership of this chamber can be brought together. So I'm on the side of optimism. We need to, yes, of course. Graeme Simpson. Secretary, for taking the intervention. The problem with all that is if you actually look at what the remit in terms of reference says, it says Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, Scotland's constitutional future. Mm. It's not dealing with wider issues like education, health, anything, anything else. It's about the constitution. Cabinet Secretary. Simpson, I'm happy to do so again, and I would suggest, because I know he's a man of open mind, and clearly he was edging towards support for the Citizens' Assembly, he should go and talk to the co-conveners. He should talk to the people who are involved in this, and he will see that they are going to interpret this, I understand, in a very wide way indeed, and have the opportunity to do so. And indeed, the remit in development and discussion with the conveners, because it has been developed and discussed with the conveners, gives exactly that flexibility. So we have an opportunity here to move forward with something new and innovative. And I think the debate tells us that there are not entirely closed minds, minds like Mr. Simpson's, which is at least partially open to persuasion. And I have to say that you know, I think those, we need to be able to persuade people that there is such an opportunity. And I want to persuade people that there is such an opportunity. And Alec Rowley asked me to address some key issues in so doing, and I want to do so presiding officer. The Citizen Assembly will be independent. I have gone through in great detail why that is so, but I confirm it yet again here. It has a published and clear remit, which it is perfectly possible, indeed desirable, for those who are running the Assembly to interpret. It will be fully transparent. I want to come on to some of the issues that Claire Baker raised in a minute. It sets its own work plan and agenda. Uh, there is a commitment for it to report to the people of Scotland, to this parliament, to the government, and for those recommendations to be taken forward. And it is established as an act of good faith. And I am grateful for the position that Mr. Rowley has taken in this because I want him at the conclusion of this to be able to say that the good faith that we showed was good faith. Mr. Rowley and I have worked opposite each other for many years. I don't think we've ever deliberately told each other a falsehood. I want to make sure that that is provable and proved by the actions of the Assembly. But it is up to the Assembly to do so. And if I can prove that to the Mr. Rowley and his party, 
I hope in time I might prove it to the Conservative benches, some more than others, I have to say. But there was a willingness, I heard from the Conservative benches, to be persuaded that the Citizens' Assembly was a good thing. And perhaps that this Citizens' Assembly might surprise them. I think it was a point that uh, Mr. Cameron made towards the end. He would like to be persuaded. Well, I would like him to be persuaded. And therefore, I want to make sure that this fully independent Citizens' Assembly uh, is able to persuade him. And I would encourage members to go and speak to the conveners. They, they are open to that. They want to do so. And in that regard, the points that Claire Baker raised are very important. There are a whole range of points and, and very sensible and important points that she raised. Issues such as you know, whether or not these would be taxed or treated uh, as difficult, the payments for benefits, issues of uh, uh, social media, issues of press. I think it is really important those are discussed by the co-conveners with you and with others. They are the people who will answer them. There's very good examples in Ireland to follow, for example, on social media, those who were part of the Citizens' Assembly could not use social media while a topic was under discussion. They were free to do so afterwards, but not while the topic was under discussion. But all the deliberative sessions were filmed, but not the private sessions of discussion. But those who did not wish to be filmed were not put in a position to be filmed. So there are all, there's lots of good practice, but I think it's important that that discussion takes place with the conveners, and every party has that opportunity. It was mentioned that there will be an invitation, as I understand it, to parties to nominate somebody for a polit political panel. Though that, that, that panel will be available to the Assembly, but at the Assembly's wish, not at the politicians' wish, to say what their position is on a whole range of issues. And it is important those are heard. It is important that the views of the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and others are heard in that politicians' panel and available to the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful. The Minister did say that he would return to the proposal from the Greens before his speech, and in the last couple of minutes, I wonder if he can put on record uh, whether the Scottish Government agrees that that should be mandated by an amendment to the Climate Change Act, if, it, if in, for no other reason, to establish the fact that it is the decision of this whole Parliament, not just of the Government. I was just coming to that point, but I'm happy to do so. I fully agree with that. I understand discussions in that matter have commenced this afternoon and will come to a conclusion. So that is a commitment we have entered into, and we are pleased to do so. And there can be discussions about future citizens' assembly. We are open to those discussions. Finally, presiding officer, with one minute to go, I want to uh, thank Mr. Rennie for his com com uh, commendation of Joanna Cherry. It was touching, to say the least. I think of, of this day of all days, the entire chamber should commend her. Look at the result in the inner house today. We should be glad that she is a person of such integrity and forthrightness. She says what she thinks. But the proposals that come to this chamber are my proposals. They are, I know I have been very restrained with the Liberal Democrats. And as I have only a minute and 12 seconds left, I want to keep that restraint in hand, no matter the encouragement not to do so. As far as this parliament is concerned, there is an entirely clear set of proposals. There is an entirely clear remit. There are two independent conveners appointed. The process of establishing the membership is underway. I have reiterated all the points in terms of the independence of this uh, Citizens' Assembly in the debate this afternoon. It is really important now that we, in my view, uh, allow our votes to follow our voices. If those people who have spoken this afternoon believe that the Citizens' Assembly is important and useful, if they take the Irish example, which was established in both cases, to look at issues within the Irish Constitution, if they believe that we require a different way of doing politics and a different type of debate, then they should certainly support the resolution. If, however, they do not believe that, then I can't imagine why they are pretending to support it, but failing to support it when we put our money where our mouth is. Please support the Citizens' Assembly and let it work independently of us so that it speaks the truth to us, which it will do. Thank you. And that concludes our debate on the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. The next item is consideration of business motion 18797 in the name of Graham Day. On behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme, can I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak of the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 18797 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed.
The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 18798 on designation of a lead committee. Again, could I ask Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. So we turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 18778.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend Motion 18778 in the name of Michael Russell on the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 18778.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, 34, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 18778 in the name of Michael Russell on the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 18778 in the name of Michael Russell is yes, 86, no, 5. There were 29 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 18798 in the name of Graham Day on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Alistair Allen on the 10th anniversary of Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight, but we'll just take a few moments for members to change and ministers to change seats.